Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this World Poetry Day uh, special event. We're also celebrating WB Yeats um, having won the Nobel Prize exactly 100 years ago. And to open the evening, please welcome His Excellency, the Ambassador of Ireland, Martin Fraser. Thank you, Siobhan, and uh, thank you to everybody for coming along to this, this wonderful occasion. I thank the Josephine Hart uh, Poetry Foundation and Siobhan, all her colleagues and our, our, our wonderful readers who will be on in a few moments for, for, for joining us tonight. Um, I suppose we're marking two important occasions. Uh, the first is the 100th anniversary of, of the award of the Nobel Prize for Literature to William Butler Yeats, uh, a great figure in English literature. Uh, a quintessential Irish person, I would say, and yet an Anglo-Irish figure, a Protestant, a nationalist, a great writer in the English language, a man who lived and worked in Ireland and in England, and someone whose work is treasured all over the world. And in that sense, I think he's um, a perfect person to celebrate 100 years on, and also a per perfect person to celebrate on World Poetry Day, which is about sharing shared values and things we all love and the values of peace and respect and tolerance that we treasure so much and that are, attack, are under attack sometimes in the world. So I think what Yeats stands for and what poetry stands for are so well recognized uh, in what we're going to hear this evening. So um, on that note, I'd just like to say thank you to all for coming along and I hope you have a wonderful, enjoyable evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so traditionally, I say a few words um, that Josephine Hart wrote for her last event, um, which was a week at the Dahmer warehouse before she sadly died. And um, as you probably know, most of you are very familiar faces. Um, Josephine Hart started um, the Poetry Hour back in the 1980s, and the British Library very kindly welcomed us here since 2004, and we do two, three events a year. And I'm just going to read Josephine's introduction after I've welcomed the actors to the stage. So please put your hands together for Mariella Frostrup, <laughs> Gavin Dray, and Bob Geldof. Hello. All, all Yates fanatics, as I guess most of us here tonight are. Um, so, uh, I don't know if I introduce myself, I'm Siobhan Wilder, and what Josephine described these poetry hours are as a public performance of the great poetry of the dead poets, read by actors. She wanted that to be the norm in London. Unfortunately, not only did her poetry hour take off, but other people have followed suit. And um, it's something that's very healing and very beneficial socially as well for people. Um, the philosophy behind the poetry hours can be simply expressed in three parts. First, the life of the poet. Josephine Hart agreed with T.S. Eliot that we understand the work better if we understand something of the poet's life. As Eliot said, the poet always writes out of his personal life, in his finest work out of its tragedy, whatever it may be, remorse, lost love, or loneliness. Therefore, Josephine Hart's introductions to the poets are always an important part of these evenings. All of her introductions to the great poets are published by Virago in Life Saving, Why We Need Poetry, and in Words That Burn and Catching Life by the Throat. Second, the poets read aloud. As Josephine saw it, poetry startles us into a more full sense of life. It is a trinity of sound, sense, and sensibility. And the sense of sound, what Robert Frost called the sound of sense, will be lost unless we hear it. Language caught alive. The gold in the ore is the sound. Seamus Heaney, as an undergraduate at Queen's, found that on hearing Eliot's four quartets, read by the actor Robert Spate, what had been perplexing when sight read for meaning only was hypnotic when read aloud. 
Yeats, in his 70s, said he spent his life clearing out of poetry every phrase written for the eye alone and bringing all back to syntax, that is, for the ear alone. Auden put it more bluntly, no poem which is not better heard than read is good poetry. And third, poetry read by great actors. Again, Josephine Hart agrees with T.S. Eliot that poetry should be read to us by skilled readers, the feeling for syllable and rhythm penetrating far below the conscious level of thought and feeling, invigorating every word. I'm going to hand over to our wonderful readers now, but before I do, I need to tell you that Denise Goff, who was to be with us this evening, had a COVID test at 4 p.m. this afternoon and was positive. So you'll have to put up with me reading in for Denise, um, but the rest will make up for that. So please enjoy the evening. Good evening and um, apologies for my lack of thespian skills, um, but hopefully my reading will um, just about suffice. Um, when he died in 1939, at the age of 73, in his house in Cap Martin in the south of France, William Butler Yeats was buried in the local churchyard. If I die here, he'd said, bury me here. Then, in a year's time, when the papers have forgotten me, dig me up and plant me in Sligo. Well, it took rather longer than a year, almost a decade. In 1948, his body was returned to be buried as he'd requested in Drumcliff Churchyard under Bear Ben Bulbin's head in the Sligo he'd loved since childhood. His headstone famously reads, cast a cold eye on life, on death, horsemen passed by. It is a compelling and enigmatic epitaph for the man who advises us to cast a cold eye as he had engaged with life, with love, and with art with an almost overwhelming passion. That tension, perhaps the fulcrum in which the poetry was created, poetry, he once said, is made out of the quarrel with oneself. He was born on the 13th of June, 1865, in Sandymount, Dublin. His father, a solicitor, was John Butler Yeats, <coughs> son and grandson of rectors in the Church of Ireland. His mother, Susan Pollocksfen, whose shipbuilding family came from Sligo, drenched his mind with the fairy folklore of the area. In 1868, his father gave up his practice to study painting in London, specifically pre-Raphaelite. Not an easy decision with a growing family. It was a lived lesson about what matters in life. One of Yeats' sisters said, when I look back on Papa's life, I marvel at his gay courage, talking literature and art and life and no income at all. Well, he lived to see one son become one of the world's greatest poets, another, Jack B. Yeats, one of Ireland's greatest painters, and his two daughters, Lily and Lolly, set up and run the famous Koala Press. That's what I call achievement. Yeats eventually attended the Godolphin School in Hammersmith, not happily, where, and this is an utterly irrelevant piece of information, uh, but one which I find rather enchanting, he became the best high diver in the school. Since years later, Ezra Pound taught him to fence, and he was an excellent fisherman. Yeats, the poet sportsman, uh, just begs to be written. Literature's luckiest volt fast, though, he turned instead to poetry, and aged 24, published The Wanderings of Ushin, written in English, based on Irish mythology, the richness of which he believed rivaled that of Greece. His early poetry was, as Seamus Heaney points out, countercultural to the realism of the Victorians. In that counterculturalism, the soul of 20th century Ireland was formed. The mystical is at the center of all that I do, all that I think, and all that I write. His acknowledged influences from the apocalyptic Blake and Shelley, also obsessed with the occult, Swedenborg, the 18th century philosopher and mystic, and notorious Madame Blavatsky, holder of seances and founder of the Theosophical Society, you were silly like us, Auden wrote in his wonderful poem in memory of W.B. Yeats. But it is not silly to know what it is your genius requires to nourish its roots. It is, in fact, a form of genius. And all his life, 
Yeats pushed at the doors of perception in pursuit of art and truth. The three early dream poems with which we open, The Stolen Child, The Host of the Air, and The Song of Wandering Angus, are poems in which the repetition of sound and image are designed to suggest a mood to lure the listener to the threshold of sleep. Don't doze off on us. <laughs> in each, someone has been stolen away. Yeats was eight when his brother Robert died and he remembered his mother crying and the sound of horses' hooves galloping away to get the doctor. A poet, he said, always writes out of his personal life, in his finest work, out of its tragedy. He never speaks directly. There is always phantasmagoria. There was indeed. Yeats often wrote in assumed persona the concept of the mask crucial to him. James Joyce, who incidentally, when he met Yeats, said, I have met you too late, you are too old for me, noted that Yeats had a surrealist imagination few painters could match. That imagination is clear in these strange and haunting poems. <clears throat> the Stolen Child. Where dips the rocky highland of Sleuth Wood in the lake, there lies a leafy island where flapping herons wake the drowsy water rats. There we've hid our fairy vats, full of berries and of reddest stolen cherries. Come away, O oh human child, to the waters and the wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. Where the wave of moonlight glosses the dim gray sands with light, far off by furthest rosses, we foot it all the night, weaving olden dances, mingling hands and mingling glances, till the moon has taken flight. To and fro we leap and chase the frothy bubbles, while the world is full of troubles and anxious in its sleep. Come away, O oh human child, to the waters and the wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. Where the wandering water rushes from the hills above Glencar, in pools among, among the rushes that scarce could bathe the star, we seek for slumbering trout and whispering in their ears, give them unquiet dreams, leaning softly out from ferns that drop their tears over the young streams. Come away, O oh human child, to the waters and the wild, with a fairy hand in hand for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. The solemn-eyed, he'll hear no more the lowing of the calves on the warm hillside, or the kettle on the hob sing peace into his breast, or see the brown mice bob round and round the oatmeal chest. For he comes, the human child, to the waters and the wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than he can understand. <clears throat> the host of the air. O'Driscoll drove with a song, the wild duck and the drake, from the tall and the tufted reeds of the drear heart lake. And he saw how the reeds grew dark at the coming of the night tide, and dreamed of the long dim hair of Bridget his bride. He heard while he sang and dreamed, a piper piping away, and never was piping so sad, and never was piping so gay. And he saw young men and young girls who danced on a level place, and Bridget his bride among them with a sad and gay face. The dancers crowded about him, and many a sweet thing said, and a young man brought him red wine, and a young girl white bread. But Bridget drew him by the sleeve, away from the merry bands, to old men playing at cards with the twinkling of ancient hands. The bread and the wine had a doom, for these were the host of the air. He sat and played in a dream of her long, dim hair. He played with the merry old men and thought not of evil chance until one bore Bridget, his bride, away from the merry dance. He bore her away in his arms, the handsomest young man there, and his neck and his breast and his arms were drowned in her long, dim hair. O'Driscoll scattered the cards and out of his dream awoke. Old men and young men and young girls 
were gone like a drifting smoke. But he heard high up in the air a piper piping away. And never was piping so sad. And never was piping so gay. The Song of Wandering Angus. I went out to the hazelwood because a fire was in my head and cut and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry to a thread. And when white moths were on the wing and moth-like stars were flickering out, I dropped the berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout. When I had laid it on the floor, I went to blow the fire aflame, but something rustled on the floor and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossom in her hair who called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air. Though I am old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands, I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hands and walk among long dappled grass and pluck till time and times are done the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun. Yeats knows life. He learns by emotion and is one of the few people who knows what violent emotion really is like, who sees from the center of it instead of trying to look in from the rim, Ezra Pound. Well, the violent emotion was inspired by Maud Gone. In 1889, she arrived in the Yeats household and instantly took possession of his soul. When the soul is lost to woman, all is lost. He was 24, a just published poet. She had read an earlier play, The Isle of Statues, which obsessed her. There is something of Lizzie Sedal in his description of her as she stood there in her youthful beauty, 22, an ex-debutante, extremely tall, flaming red hair and strange, angry eyes. He saw her as a luminous vision, but it was her passionate nature which began all the trouble of my life, and which was to inspire some of the greatest love poetry ever written. He'd found the love of his life. She had found a poet for the cause. He was doomed from the start. For though he did not know it at the time, and would later say, she was complete when I met her, I was not. She was in love with the married Lucian Millevoy, with whom she would have two children out of wedlock, a boy who died, and a daughter, Isolt, of whom more later. Millevoy was a French right-wing revolutionary writer, as involved with politics as she was, including the Irish nationalist cause. Yeats' obsession with Maud Gone lasted all his life. He proposed endlessly, but she would become neither mistress nor wife. Though years later the relationship was consummated, Maud's suggestion that they pledge themselves afterwards to a mystical union of brother and sister could not have been reassuring. This magnificent, brave, and talented woman who took the lead in the Countess Kathleen was also dangerous and violent with a fanatical love of Ireland, although not Irish herself. She was twice imprisoned for her activities and was eventually buried in Glasnevin Cemetery with Ireland's heroes. Yeats wrote of her. She lived in storm and strife. Her soul had such desire for what proud death may bring that it could not endure the common good of life. And therein lies the pity. And yet, for all the pain she caused, there is, I think, little regret. Here is a fascinating quote about him, from him, about the nature of obsession. All our lives long, as da Vinci says, we long for our destruction and how, when we find it in the shape of a most fair woman, can we do less than leave all others for her? Do we not seek our dissolution from her lips? He, un he understood the erotic of Olivia Shakespeare, the married woman with whom Yeats first experienced sexual love. He wrote, she was too wholesome to my inmost being, an insight of which Freud would have been proud. Tragic ecstasy, Yeats believed, was the best that art, perhaps life, can give us. 
Well, there was much tragic ecstasy with Maud gone. Her eventual marriage to Major Sean McBride, a man she believed had a stronger will than she had, which must have been something, uh, was terrible for him. Like lightning through me, he said. McBride was a revolutionary, as extreme as she was. Professor Foster tells us they spent part of their honeymoon allegedly reconnoitering assassination attempts for an impending royal visit to Gibraltar. Their union was a disaster, and they separated after five years. Sean McBride was executed with the leaders of the 1916 rebellion and is named by Yeats in Easter 1916. Again, Yeats, now 51, proposed, and yet again, he was rejected in a strange Jamesian episode. Yeats, in despair, proposed to her daughter by Millevoy Isolt, who wisely turned him down. Finally, Yeats married Georgie Hyde Lees, who happily discovered her talent for automatic writing on her honeymoon and worked with Yeats on the extraordinary book, A Vision. They had two adored children, Michael and Anne. Marriage, in the shadow of Maud Gone, was not easy. Yeats once apologized to his wife for the persistence of her image in his imagination. He said he went to sleep with the endeavor to send his soul to her. However, on his deathbed, having read Maud Gon's ironically titled A Servant to the Queen, the man who was deaf and blind and dumb with love commented with considerable coolness to Olivia Manning, she had a remarkable intellect at the service of the will, no will at the service of the intellect. Quite brilliant, sharp. Uh, we <laughs> open with short, passionate cries of hopeless love, cries of the heart against necessity, and in this section also Adam's curse, a conversation between Yeats, Maud Gone, and her sister about art and beauty and love and the hidden labor in each. Leda and the Swan, the mythological savagery of the erotic, then two short poems in the voice of a woman, the mermaid, and before the world was made. We end with friends. Now must I these three praise. The three are Olivia Shakespeare, Lady Gregory, and of course, Maud Gone. 27 years after he'd met her, her very image makes him shake from head to foot. Long love indeed. Now to the pity of love. The pity of love. A pity beyond all telling is hid in the heart of love. The folk who are buying and selling, the clouds on their journey above, the cold wet winds ever blowing, and the shadowy hazel grove where mouth gray waters are flowing, threaten the head that I love. When you are old, when you are old and gray and full of sleep and nodding by the fire, take down this book and slowly read and dream of the soft look your eyes had once and of their shadows deep. How many loved your moments of glad grace and loved your beauty with love false or true. But one man loved the pilgrim soul in you and loved the sorrows of your changing face. And bending down beside the glowing bars, murmur a little sadly how love fled and paced upon the mountains overhead and hid his face among a crowd of stars. <clears throat> he wishes for the clots of heaven. Had I the heavens embroidered clots and wrought with golden and silver light the blue and the dim and the dark clots of night and light and the half light, I would spread the clots under your feet. But I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly because you tread on my dreams. The folly of being comforted. One that is ever kind said yesterday, your well-beloved's hair is threads of grey, and little shadows come about her eyes. Time can but make it easier to be wise, though now it seems impossible, and so all that you need is patience. Heart cries, no, 
I have not a crumb of comfort, not a grain. Time can but make her beauty over again. Because of that great nobleness of hers, the fire that stirs about her when she stirs burns but more clearly. Oh, she had not these ways when all the wild summer was in her gaze. O oh, heart, O oh, heart, if she'd but turn her head, you'd know the folly of being comforted. Adam's Curse. We sat together at one summer's end, that beautiful, mild woman, your close friend, and you and I, and talked of poetry. I said, a line will take us hours, maybe. Yet if it does not seem a moment's thought, our stitching and unstitching has been naught. Better go down upon your marrow bones and scrub a kitchen pavement, or break spone, stones like an old pauper in all kinds of weather. For to articulate sweet sounds together is to work harder than all of these, and yet be thought an idler by the noisy set of bankers, schoolmasters, and clergymen, the martyr, martyrs call the world. And thereupon, that beautiful, mild woman for whose sake there's many a one shall find out all heartache, on finding that her voice was sweet and low, replied, to be born a woman is to know, although they do not talk of it in school, that we must labor to be beautiful. I said it's certain there is no fine thing since Adam's fall, but needs much laboring. There have been lovers who thought love should be so much compounded of high courtesy that they would sigh and quote with learned looks precedence out of the beautiful old books. Yet now it seems an idle trade enough. We sat, grown quiet at the name of love. We saw the last embers of daylight die, and in the trembling blue green of the sky, a moon, worn as if it had been a shell, washed by time's waters as they rose and fell about the stars and broke in days and years. I had a thought for no one's but your ears, that you were beautiful, and that I strove to love you in the old highway of love, that it all seemed happy, and yet I've grown as weary-hearted as that yellow moon. Never give all the heart. Never give all the heart, for love will hardly seem worth thinking of to passionate women if it seems certain. And they never dream that it fades out from kiss to kiss. For everything that's lovely is but a brief, dreamy, kind delight. Oh, never give the heart outright. For they, for all smooth lips can say, have given their hearts up to the play. And who could play it well enough if deaf and dumb and blind with love? He that made this knows all the cost, for he gave all his heart and lost. Oh, do not love too long. Sweetheart, do not love too long. I loved long and long and grew to be out of fashion like an old song. All through the years of our youth, neither could have known their own thought from the others. We were so much at one. But oh, in a minute she changed. Oh, do not love too long, or you will grow out of fashion like an old song. <coughs> no second Troy. Why should I blame her that she fill my days with misery? or that she would of late have taught to ignorant men most violent ways. Or hurled the little streets upon the great had they but courage equal to desire. What could have made her peaceful with a mind that nobleness made simple as a fire, with beauty like a tightened bow, a kind that is not natural in an age like this, being high and solitary and most stern? Why, what could she have done being what she is? Was there another Troy for her to burn? A woman, Homer, sung. 
If any man drew near when I was young, I thought he holds her dear and shook with hate and fear. But oh, twas bitter wrong if he could pass her by with an indifferent eye. Whereon I wrote and wrought, and now being grey, I dream that I have brought to such a pitch my thought that coming time can say he shadowed in a glass what thing her body was. For she had fiery blood when I was young and trod so sweetly proud as twere on a cloud, a woman Homer sung, that life and letter seemed but an heroic dream. Why did I get all these poems about <laughs> old people, you know? <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> Must be a mistake. <laughs> so this is for everybody out there, a drinking song. <laughs> Wine comes in at the mouth and love comes in at the eye. That's all we shall know for truth before we grow old and die. I lift the glass to my mouth, I look at you and I sigh. <laughs> Laid in the swan, a sudden blow, the great wings beating still above the staggering girl, her thighs caressed by the dark webs, her nape caught in his bill, he holds her helpless breast upon his breast. How can those terrified vague fingers push the feathered glory from her loosening thighs? And how can body laid in that white rush but feel the strange heart beating where it lies? A shudder in the loins engendered there, the broken wall, the burning roof and tower, and Agamemnon dead. Being so caught up, so mastered by the brute of the air, did she put on his knowledge with his power before the indifferent beak could let her drop? Before the world was made, if I make the lashes dark and the eyes more bright and the lips more scarlet, or ask if all be right from mirror after mirror, no vanities displayed, I'm looking for the face I had before the world was made. What if I look upon a man as though on my beloved, and my blood be cold the while and my heart unmoved? Why should he think me cruel or that he is betrayed? I'd have him love me for the thing that was before the world was made. Friends, now must I these three praise, three women that have wrought what joy is in my days. One, because no thoughts, nor those on passing cares, no, not in these 15 many times troubled years, could ever come between mind and delighted mind and one because her hand had strength that could unbind, that none could understand, that none could have and thrive, youth's dreamy load, till she so changed me that I live laboring in ecstasy. And what of her that took all till my youth was gone with scarce a pitying look? How could I praise that one? When days begin to break, I count my good and bad, being wakeful for her sake, remembering what she had, what eagle look still shows, while up from the heart's root so great a sweetness flows, I shake from head to foot. Yeats, wrote Eliot, is one of those few poets whose history is the history of their own time, who are a part of the consciousness of an age which cannot be understood without them. And, he continued, this is a very high position to assign him, but I believe it is one which is secure. Eliot, of course, is right. Yeats, not only in his poetry, but in the plays which he wrote and commissioned for the Abbey Theatre, which he founded with Lady Gregory, was central to the creation of modern Ireland. And in 1923, when Yeats was 58, he was awarded the Nobel Prize. The subject of his speech, a modest and generous speech calling up the ghost of Singh to stand beside him, was not poetry. I have chosen as my theme the Irish dramatic movement, adding, 
that had my lyric poetry not had the quality of speech spoken on the stage, I would not be here, nor would I be here were I not the symbol of a movement. When we thought of the plays we would like to perform, we thought of everything that was romantic and poetical. For the nationalism we had called up in moments of discouragement was romantic and poetical. Well, up to a point. These romantic and poetical plays were to cause riots. You've been a very good audience so far tonight. <laughs> Yeats had a genius for spotting and encouraging genius in others. Singh, whom he met in Paris, was very delicate. He was persuaded by Yeats to go to the bleak and bitter Aran Islands to write the playboy of the Western world. When Singh protested, but I'll die there, Yeats replied, not before you've written your masterpiece. <laughs> masterpiece it is, but the Abbey audience hated it and rioted. They did not wish to be portrayed as Singh portrayed them. On the first night of The Plough and the Stars by O'Casey, who Yeats believed had a mind like Dostoevsky, another riot occurred in the Abbey Theatre, which had possibly the most hypersensitive audience in history. Riots were common. Yeats fought back famously, haranguing them from the stage. You have disgraced yourselves again. And he, pers and he persevered. He had great strength of character. Throwing himself into life, poet, playwright, theater founder and manager, senator, he tried and failed notoriously to get a bill of divorcement through the Irish <laughs> Senate. <laughs> that he tried at all is astonishing. The poems you're about to hear are, in a sense, public poems, reactions to events. In the case of September 1913, to public resistance to the cost of building an art gallery to house the Lane collection of Impressionist paintings. The refrain, Romantic Ireland's dead and gone, calls up the vision of O'Leary's The Fenian Leader, for whose moral qualities Yeats had great respect often quoting a line by O'Leary, which resonates today. There are things a man must not do to save a nation. Of the Easter Rebellion 1916 and the execution of the leaders, Yeats wrote to Lady Gregory, I had no idea any public event could move me so deeply. Easter 1916 is one of the greatest political poems in this or any language, in this or any century. The Second Coming, a precursor to the Wasteland, was written in early 1919, after the First World War. Yet it doesn't look back on horror, but forward. It is imbued with an apocalyptic vision of what is to come. What is to come has always been there, the rough beast, the beast of the apocalypse. I began to imagine, as always, at my left side, just out of the range of sight, a brazen winged beast which I associated with laughing, ecstatic destruction. That beast is described in my poem, The Second Coming. It is a frightening, subversive masterpiece. As always, there was tension between these public poems and the longing for the stillness essential to art, of which he had once said, it is a solitary man. That tension is clear in the lovely poem, The Fisherman, for whom he wishes to write one poem as cold and passionate as the dawn. There's also tension in his mesmerizing elegy for two beautiful sisters, Constance Markovich and Ava Gore Booth, first evoked in their lovely youth, and then, with some bitterness, in their lives of political turbulence before their early deaths. But the disillusionment here is his rather than theirs. And he finds consolation elsewhere, sailing to Byzantium with its marvelous opening line, this is no country for old men. The last poem in this section, like the fisherman, celebrates art, which may gather us into the artifice of eternity, and thus on a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium. But first to September 1913. September 1913. What need you being come to sense but fumble in a greasy till and add the half pence to the pence and prayer to shivering prayer until you have dried the marrow from the bone? 
for men were born to pray and save. Romantic Ireland's dead and gone, it's with O'Leary in the grave. Yet they were of a different kind, the names that stilled your childish play. They have gone about the world like wind, but little time had they to pray for whom the hangman's rope was spun. And what, God help us, could they save? Romantic Ireland's dead and gone, it's with O'Leary in the grave. Was it for this the wild geese spread the grey wing upon every tide? For this that all that blood was shed? For this Edward Fitzgerald died, and Robert Emmett and Wolfe Tone, all that delirium of the brave? Romantic Ireland's dead and gone, it's with O'Leary in the grave. Yet could we turn the years again and call those exiles as they were in all their loneliness and pain? You'd cry, some woman's yellow hair has maddened every woman's son. They weighed so lightly what they gave, but let them be. They're dead and gone. They're with O'Leary in the grave. Easter 1916. I have met them at close of day, coming with vivid faces from counter or desk among grey 18th century houses. I have passed with a nod of the head or polite meaningless words, or have lingered a while and said polite meaningless words, and thought before I'd done of a mocking tale or a jibe to please a companion around the fire at the club, being certain that they and I but lived where motley is worn. All changed, changed utterly. The terrible beauty is born. That woman's days were spent in ignorant goodwill, her nights in argument until her voice grew shrill. What voice more sweet than hers when young and beautiful she rode to harriers? This man had kept a school and rode our winged horse. This other, his helper and friend, was coming into his force. He might have won fame in the end, so sensitive his nature seemed, so daring and sweet his thought. This other man I had dreamed a drunken, vain, glorious lout. He had done most bitter wrong to some who are near my heart, yet I number him in the song. He too has resigned his part in the casual comedy. He too has been changed in his turn, transformed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. Hearts with one purpose alone through summer and winter seem enchanted to a stone to trouble the living stream. The horse that comes from the road, the rider, the birds that range from cloud to tumbling cloud, minute by minute they change. A shadow of cloud on the stream changes minute by minute. A horse hoof slides on the brim and a horse plashes within it. The long-legged moorhens dive and hens to moorcocks call. Minute by minute they live, the stones in the midst of all. Too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. Oh, when may it suffice? That is heaven's part. Our part to murmur name upon name as a mother names her child when sleep at last has come on limbs that had run wild. What is it but nightfall? No, no, not night, but death. Was it needless death after all? For England may keep faith for all that is done and said. We know their dream, enough to know they dreamed and are dead. And what if excess of love bewildered them till they died? I write it out in a verse. Macdonough and Macbride and Connolly and Pierce now and in time to be wherever green is worn are changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. The Fisherman. Although I can see him still, a freckled man who goes to a gray place on a hill in gray Connemara clothes at dawn to cast his flies, it's long since I began to call up to the eyes this wise and simple man. 
All day I'd looked in the face what I had hoped it would be to write for my own race and the reality, the living men that I hate, the dead man that I loved, the craven man in his seat, the insolent unreproved, the no knave brought to book who has won a drunken cheer, the witty man in his joke aimed at the commonest ear, the clever man who cries, the catch cries of the clown, the beating down of the wise, and the great art beaten down. Maybe a 12 months since, suddenly I began in scorn of this audience, imagining a man and his sun freckled face and gray Connemara cloth, climbing up to a place where stone is dark under froth, and the down turn in his wrist when the flies drop in the stream. A man who does not exist, a man who is but a dream, and cried, before I am old, I shall have written him one poem, maybe as cold and as passionate as the dawn. In memory of Eva Gore Booth and Con Markovich. The light of evening, Lissadell, great windows open to the south, two girls in silk kimonos, both beautiful, one a gazelle. But a raving autumn shears blossom from the summer's wreath. The older is condemned to death, pardoned, drags out lonely years conspiring among the ignorant. I know not what the younger dreams, some vague utopia, and she seems, when withered, old, and skeleton gaunt, an image of such politics. Many a time I think to seek one or the other out and speak of that old Georgian mansion, mix pictures of the mind, recall that table and the talk of youth. Two girls in silk kimonos, both beautiful, one a gazelle. Dear shadows, now you know it all, all the folly of a fight with a common wrong or right. The innocent and the beautiful have no enemy but time. Arise and bid me strike a match and strike another till time catch. Should the conflagration climb, run till all the sages know we, the great gazebo built, they convicted us of guilt. Bid me strike a match and blow. The second coming. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the centre cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming, hardly are those words out when a vast image out of Spiritus Mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs, while all about it reel shadows of indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again. But now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle, and what rough beast its hour come round at last slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Sailing to Byzantium. That is no country for old men. The young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song. The salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas, fish, flesh or fowl, commend all summer long whatever is begotten, born and dies. Caught in that sensual music, all neglect, monuments of unaging intellect. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, 
and let soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Nor is there singing school but studying monuments of its own magnificence. And therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. O sages standing in God's holy fire, as in the gold mosaic of a wall, come from the holy fire, purn in a gyre, and by the singing masters of my soul, consume my heart away. Sick with desire and fastened to a dying animal, it knows not what it is, and gather me into the artifice of eternity. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing, but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammering gold and gold enameline to keep a drowsy emperor awake or set upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. One never tires of life, he wrote, and at the last must die of thirst with the cup at one's lip. Late Yeats is extraordinary. Some of his finest poems were written in the last six or seven years of his life. The courage rooted in his capacity for experience, he now gives us the barbarism of truth. In dreams, he once wrote, begins responsibility, and the summing up is harsh in many of them. Did that play of mine send out certain men the English shot? The echo answers, lie down and die. Some of the most quoted lines in Eliot's masterpiece, Four Quartets, are spoken in the voice of the older Yeats. They concern the gifts reserved for age, the cold friction of expiring sense, the impetus, impotence of rage at human folly, the laceration of laughter at what ceases to amuse, the rending pain of reenactment of all that you have done and been. Of Yeats' last poems, Eliot said, to what honest man old enough can these sentiments be alien? The poems, What Then, sang Plato's ghost, The Spur, Why Should Not Old Men Be Mad, Meru. But man's life is thought, and he, despite his terror, cannot cease, ravening through century after century, ravening, raging, and uprooting, that he may come into the desolation of reality. The Municipal Gallery Revisited, with its lovely last line about friendship, is a kinder summing up. Then we have the mysterious, austere, long-legged fly, suggesting as it does that violent historical events and art may begin in strange stillness, underneath which, as Heaney tells us, lies in this poem an impla implacable artistic drive. It's a difficult poem, but worth the time. The Circus Animal's Desertion is possibly the truest poem ever written about creativity. We end with the ironically titled Politics, the last poem he wrote, in which Yeats returns with an exhausted sweetness to the universal theme of love, agreeing, it would seem with Browning, love is best. But first to what then? What then? His chosen comrades thought at school he must grow a famous man. He thought the same and lived by rule, all his twenties crammed with toil. What then, sang Plato's ghost, what then? Everything he wrote was read. After certain years, he won sufficient money for his need, friends that have been friends indeed. What then, sang Plato's ghost, what then? All his happier dreams came true. A small old house, wife, daughter, son, grounds where plum and cabbage grew, poets and wits about him drew. What then, sang Plato's ghost, what then? The work is done, grown old, he thought. According to my boyish plan, let the fools rage. I swerved in naught, something to perfection brought. But louder, sang that ghost, yeah, what then? <laughs> yeah, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell. Typecasting. 
Yeah, except it's all true. <laughs> <laughs> the spur. You think it horrible that lust and rage should dance attention upon my old age. They were not such a plague when I was young. What else have I to spur me into song? <laughs> 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 It'll come to you. It'll come to you, Gavin. The laugh. Don't chuckle too loudly, dude. <laughs> I'm just reading the title of the next one. <laughs> Why should not old men be mad? <laughs> that insult to injury, Bob. <laughs> Why should not old men be mad? Some have known a likely lad that had a sound fly fisher's wrist turned to a drunken journalist, a girl that knew old Dante once lived to bear children to a dunce. A Helen of social welfare dream, climb onto a wagonette to scream. Some think it a matter of course that chance should starve good men in bad advance, that if their neighbors figured plain as though upon a lighted screen, no single story would they find of an unbroken happy mind, a finish worthy of the start. Young men know nothing of this sort. Observant old men know it well. <laughs> and when they know what old books tell, and that no better can be had, Know then why old men should be mad. Maru. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> Civilization is hooped together, brought under a rule, under the semblance of peace by manifold illusion. But man's life is thought, and he, despite his terror, cannot cease, ravening through centuries after century, ravening, raging, and uprooting that he may come into the desolation of reality. Egypt and Greece, goodbye, and goodbye, Rome. Hermits upon Mount Meru or Everest, caverned in night under the drifted snow, or where that snow in winter's dreadful blast beat down upon their naked bodies, know that day bring round the night, that before dawn his glory and his monuments are gone. The Municipal Gallery Revisited. Around me, the images of 30 years, an ambush, pilgrims at the waterside, casement upon trial, half hidden by the bars, guarded, Griffith staring in hysterical pride, Kevin O'Higgins countenance that wears a gentle questioning look that cannot hide a soul incapable of remorse or rest a revolutionary soldier kneeling to be blessed, an abbot or archbishop with an upraised hand blessing the tricolor. This is not, I say, the dead Ireland of my youth, but an Ireland the poets have imagined, terrible and gay. Before a woman's portrait, suddenly I stand, beautiful and gentle in her Venetian way. I met her all but 50 years ago, for 20 minutes in some studio. Heart smitten with emotion, I sink down, my heart recovering with covered eyes. Wherever I had looked, I had looked upon my permanent or impermanent images. Augusta Gregory's son, her sister's son, Hugh Lane, only begetter of all these. Hazel Lavery, living and dying. That tale as though some ballad singer had sung it all. Mancini's portrait of Augusta Gregory, greatest since Rembrandt, according to John Singh. A great ebullient portrait, certainly. But where is the brush that could show anything of all that pride and that humanity? And I am in despair that time may bring approved patterns of women or of men, but not that self-same excellence again. My medieval knees lack health until they bend, but in that woman, in that household where honor had lived so long, all lacking found. Childless, I thought, my children may find here deep-rooted things, but never foresaw its end. And now that end has come, I have not wept. No fox can foul the lair the badger swept. An image out of Spencer and the common tongue, John Singh. I and Augusta Gregory thought all that we did, all that we said or sang, must come from contact with the soil. From that contact, everything, Antaeus-like, grew strong. We three alone in modern times 
had brought everything down to that sole test again. Dream of the noble and the beggar man. And here's John Singh himself, that rooted man, forgetting human words, a grave, deep face. You that would judge me, do not judge alone, this book or that. Come to this hallowed place where my friend's portraits hang and look thereon. Ireland's history in their linements trace. Think where man's glory most begins and ends. And say, my glory was, I had such friends. Long-legged fly, that civilization may not sink, its great battle lost, quiet the dog, tether the pony to a distant post. Our master Caesar is in the tent where the maps are spread, his eyes fixed upon nothing, a hand under his head. Like a long-legged fly upon the stream, his mind moves upon silence. Let the topless towers be burnt, and men recall that face. Move most gently, if move you must, in this lonely place. She thinks, part woman, three parts a child, but nobody looks. Her feet practice a tinker shuffle, picked up on a street. Like a long-legged fly upon the stream, her mind moves upon silence. That girls of puberty might find the first Adam in their thoughts. Shut the door of the Pope's chapel, keep those children out. There on that scaffolding reclines Michelangelo. With no more sound than the mice make, his hands move to and fro. Like a long-legged fly upon the stream, his mind moves upon silence. The circus animal's desertion. I sought a theme and sought for it in vain. I sought it daily for six weeks or so. Maybe at last being but a broken man, I must be satisfied with my heart. Although winter and summer till old age began, my circus animals were all on show. Those stilted boys, that burnished chariot, lion and woman and the Lord knows what. What can I but enumerate old themes? First, that sea rider ushing, led by the nose through three enchanted islands, allegorical dreams, vain gaiety, vain battle, vain repose, themes of the embittered heart, or so it seems that might adorn old songs or courtly shows. But what cared I that set him on to ride? I starved for the bosom of his fairy bride. And then a counter-truth filled out its play. The Countess Kathleen was the name I gave it. She, pity-crazed, had given her soul away, but masterful heaven had intervened to save it. I thought my dear must her own soul destroy, so did fanaticism and hate enslave it. And this brought forth a dream. And soon enough, this dream itself had all my thought and love. And when the fool and blind man stole the bread, Cúhollán fought the ungovernable sea, Heart mysteries there. And yet, when all is said, it was the dream itself enchanted me. Character isolated by a deed to engross the present and dominate memory. Players and painted stage took all my love and not those things that they were emblems of. Those masterful images, because complete, grew in pure mind. But out of what began? A mound of refuse or the sweepings of a street, old kettles, old bottles and a broken can, old iron, old bones, old rags, that raving slut who keeps the till. Now that my ladder's gone, I must lie down where all the ladders start, in the foul rag and bone shop of the heart. Politics, Ambassador. <laughs> How can I, that girl standing there, my attention fix on Roman or on Russian or on Spanish or Ukrainian politics? 
Yet here's a travel man that knows what he talks about, and there's a politician that has read and thought, and maybe what they say is true of war and war's alarms. Oh, that I were young again and held her in my arms. Lead this. Thank you. Thank you. Don't go away. Stay. No. <laughs> Stay. Go. No. Oh, you want to Stay. Stay. Stay for a bit. Oh. <laughs> Take a bow. <laughs> Thank you.